And we must move on to questions to the Minister for Communities. Question one has been withdrawn. I therefore call Harold McKee for his question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, question number two, please. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. A public consultation into the proposed closure of the Cookstown, Malnahinch and Newcastle Social Security offices and job centres was launched on the 20th of September and will complete on the 15th of uh, November. The consultation is an opportunity for claimant staff, public representatives and other stakeholders to comment on and raise concerns regarding the proposed closure of these offices. Decisions will not be made until I have had an opportunity to fully consider all responses to the consultation. Harold McKee for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, given all the changes to Social Security being brought in at the moment and the extra resources which we have been put into advice services, does the Minister recognise that closing jobs and benefits offices in major towns across the country makes no sense? Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, what does make sense is my department reviewing the services that it provides in light of the changes that are coming about through the introduction of universal credit. Uh, welfare is changing and therefore the services that my department provides need to uh, recognise that environment and deliver services efficiently in a uh, space where budgets are constrained that my department has to deal with. Obviously, we are looking at the responses and I will consider them in due course. Aram, sir, Colin McGrath. Uh, can the minister advise the House why he did not have 60 to 90 seconds today to be able to meet the staff out in the Great Hall to receive their petition, which at the very least might have been a nice gesture? Well, Deputy Speaker, today I was opening up a new facility for young people who come out of care in my own constituency that Fold and Max and I have been dealing with, uh, something that will help people who have been homeless. Uh, then I went to meet with uh, people from the faith community at a conference that was held at the Ramada Hotel, and I arrived in Parliament buildings five minutes ago to deal with question time. If the individuals are still here in the Great Hall when the debate commences, I'm more than happy to meet with them. I call Keith Buchanan. Thank you, and thank the Minister for his answer so far. Uh, can the Minister confirm to me that all claimants will have uh, access to the same level of uh, customer service that they currently do have? But Deputy Speaker, in respect of uh, claimants, there should not be any negative impacts in terms of customer service. Uh, claimants impacted by any proposed closures will continue to be able to access face-to-face -face services from alternative offices within reasonable travelling distance. Uh, there will be a greater choice of access channels for customers with discretionary support offering a telephony delivery model and universal credit, uh, an online one. Here, I'm sir, Linda Dill. Can the Minister provide an overview on what discussions he had with the unions and staff representatives prior to this consultation? Well, Deputy Speaker, the consultation process is being carried out by the Department. I approve the process to commence. Uh, obviously, there will have been engagement with my departmental officials uh, and those on the trade union side, but this is a, a consultation process. No decisions have been taken. Uh, obviously, the, the, closure, the proposals for consultation, uh, that process closes today. Uh, we have a debate later this afternoon uh, that uh, members have brought forward. Um, indeed, the, the member herself has brought it forward, uh, and I will be able to elaborate more in terms of the process that is being followed and, and what the next steps may be. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister what rural proofing criteria he will use when making the decision to close, um, or if he's going to close any of these Social Security offices, given the fact that in my constituency, Balnehinch, face to face meetings at other areas is not going to be possible because transport is so limited? But Deputy Speaker, uh, there was uh, a rural, pro uh, rural, proof, uh, rural proofing uh, in terms of engaging with the Department of Agriculture. Uh, that document was published on the 4th of November. Uh, uh, and obviously, these are all issues that need to be taken into account whenever we're dealing with this. Uh, let me say, members, the, the service is changing. Uh, the need for people to come in and sign on uh, is changing. Uh, and obviously, I'm uh, concerned about delivering a service that best meets the needs of the individuals who have to use the service, um, but also uh, delivering a service that my department is responsible for within the budgetary constraints uh, that exist. Call Naomi Long for a question. Question number three, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, the member will be aware that Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998 
places a statutory duty on all public authorities to promote equality of opportunity between a wide range of groups, such as persons of different religious beliefs, political opinion, racial group, uh, age, marital status uh, or sexual orientation, between men and women generally, between persons with a disability and persons without, and between persons with dependents and persons without. Furthermore, Section 75.2 of the Act states a public authority in carrying out its functions relating to Northern Ireland shall have regard to promoting good relations between persons of different, different religious belief, political opinion or racial group. And my department has published an interim equality scheme which sets out how, as a department, we propose to fulfil our Section 75 statutory duties. In addition, my department is required to provide an annual progress report to the Equality Commission setting out how we have delivered against those statutory duties. The first department for community Section 75 annual progress report will be completed uh, for the 2016-17 year and will be made available following submission to the Equality Commission in August 2017. And I'll be happy to have a copy when published sent to the member if that would be useful. Naomi Long for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for um, his answer with respect to setting out what Section 75 is, is meant to achieve. However, I would like to take the opportunity, if I could, Mr Speaker, to remind the Minister of the question, which is that what action he is intending to take to improve good relations with respect to those with different sexual orientations. And perhaps he could address that specific issue um, in his answer. Well, Deputy Speaker, uh, Section 75 uh, is what's applicable right across those areas that I've highlighted in terms of departments and the duties that departments have uh, to deal with all of the issues that are raised in, some, in Section 75. That is the statutory instrument uh, that departments have to abide by, and I'll certainly do that. Here, Mr. Claire Hanna. Call Mr. Claire. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and Colin, could I ask the Minister what action he's taking to meet and engage with the LGBT community as he develops his departmental strategy? Well, obviously, my door is open to people who want to engage with me. Uh, this is a, an area that I've touched upon uh, within the House before, that whenever we're dealing with uh, all of the areas within Section 75 and the different groups that exist, uh, we have uh, different characteristics that people will identify by. It is important that we, as a society, respect all of those different characteristics, and we find a space within our society where people can accommodate those differences uh, and where those differences exist, that they can be expressed in a way that is respectful. Uh, I think it is important that, uh, in the promotion of one's identity, we do not need to denigrate another individual's identity, uh, and that is the way in which I think our society would be best placed to evolve uh, when it comes to dealing respectfully with individuals, irrespective of their background. I call Gary Middle. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister outline uh, his approach to dealing with the needs of uh, people right across the Section 75 groups? Well, th this is an issue that I think is very important to us. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, the case that was heard in the, the Court of Appeal uh, raised the issue about uh, the conflict that at times can exist. Uh, and I think in a society, we need to find ways in which we can navigate those differences. Um, but it, it is uh, beyond the issues that seem to dominate the debate when we come to Section 75, and that is between sexual orientation and religious belief. When we look at all of those groups in Section 75, uh, it's about helping people who have disabilities uh, and the broad spectrum uh, that it covers. And I think it's important that we look at all of those issues in the totality and we find a way in which we can address all of those issues that are raised uh, by the way in which people identify uh, in a manner that you try to find a respectful dialogue, but acknowledging that differences do exist and where you can make reasonable accommodation for that, that's something that should be uh, carried forward. Here, Mr. Fran McCann, I call Fran McCann. Of, uh, last can call you, and I thank the Minister for his uh, answers uh, up to now. He's partially answered uh, the question that I was going to uh, ask, but how can he uh, ensure that equality protections will be adhered to for the LGBT community in his department, and will that include arms length bodies? The issue around Section 75 is applicable to arms length bodies as well, and obviously uh, all of those arms length bodies should be complying with the law. So uh, I would expect, uh, whether it's my department uh, or the arms length bodies, when it comes to dealing with all of these issues, that you find a way in which you're going to comply with the law and that everybody uh, can be treated equally in terms of the uh, services that have to be delivered uh, by the state. Uh, but I make that comment again that 
there will be occasions where different characteristics identified within Section 75 at times there will be conflict. Uh, and it is in that space that we need to find a way in which our society can manage that. Um, and again, I don't believe that in the promotion of one's identity that should be uh, carried forward in a way that would denigrate uh, another individual's identity. And it's in that space that I think the challenge is to this Assembly uh, what type of society do we want to have? Is it one that respects that difference? Is it one that can accommodate uh, reasonably those differences? Or is it one where uh, a particular Section 75 group will want to enforce its will upon another Section 75 group? That isn't equality, uh, and I believe there's a better way to do things than what has happened here before. I call Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister confirm that LGBT representative groups have sought to engage constructively with him and his department and give a commitment that he won't let the minority who may troll on the internet affect the work that he does with the community? Well, I think the, the member does make a valid point. I think there, are, there will be individuals um, who will identify uh, in whatever form of characteristic that um, I've referred to so far. Uh, that will be on the extremes, uh, and that uh, is, is something that shouldn't put people off being able to have dialogue around these issues. Uh, and uh, I can give that assurance that um, I, I recognise that uh, social media can be a very powerful tool, very useful, um, but it does attract individuals that will at times misrepresent the broader interests of that particular uh, characteristic that is identified. Um, so. Uh, again, my door is open. I am happy to have a conversation around these issues. I think that that is important, and it is important that that conversation is carried out in a respectful manner, recognising that people will, will come to the, the table with having different views um, as to how we navigate around these issues. Uh, but if the starting place on all of that is treating each other with respect, then potentially there is a way in which we can find an accommodation. I call Stephen Farry for a question. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question four, please. Deputy Speaker, following publication of the panel's report on the 7th of June, the Executive launched its action plan for tackling paramilitary activity, criminality and organised crime on the 19th of July. Implementation of this plan is being taken forward by a cross-departmental programme board led by the Department for Justice. I am fully committed to delivering on my department's responsibilities within the action plan, and these include to work with local voluntary and community organisations to promote a culture of lawfulness, to take forward a programme to increase the influence of women in community development, to establish a fund to support ambitious initiatives aimed at building capacity in communities in transition, and to consider how funding can be made available within existing accountability guidelines for managing public money to support such activities. This work forms an integral part of the new programme for government, and we have made significant progress to date in consulting with key stakeholders across all sectors, and will continue to report progress through the programme board. Stephen Ferry for a supplementary. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm concerned that the Minister has actually uh, omitted to uh, refer to recommendation D2 of the panel's report, which refers to the need to tackle uh, segregation in housing and to set ambition, ambitious targets and milestones in that regard, and also to remind the Minister that the, the Fresh Start Agreement itself actually links the issue of, of tackling division uh, as being central to eradicating paramilitary activity. So, therefore, can I ask the Minister to confirm that, in his view and his this department's view, there is a very firm link to the promotion of mixed, shared, and integrated housing to actually finally eradicate and paramilitary activity from our society. Deputy Speaker, it's an issue that has been touched on before in this assembly about um, shared housing, and I believe that when you create the environment uh, where people can have confidence, then you will uh, naturally develop uh, shared housing. Um, uh, there are specific requirements that, of course, my department, when it comes to developing. Uh, those shared housing areas, uh, we will do that. Uh, but in the broader sense, um, whether it's uh, social housing uh, or whether it's in private housing, it's about building uh, confidence within our communities where people feel at ease with one, each other, uh, with one another, um, and that will then develop into mixed housing areas. What, what, I, what I don't believe in is uh, somehow socially engineering, socially engineering outcomes. People should be given houses on the basis of need. And uh, it shouldn't be on the basis of one's religion. And I recognise for the Alliance Party that's a strange concept. They supported, they, they supported the discrimination of Protestants when it came to the recruitment into the police service. Uh, and to put forward a case that people should be denied a house on the basis of one's religion is one that I won't support. 
Just to remind members, uh, no comments from the seated position, please. Um, Aram Sir Nicola Malm. Call Nicola Malm. You, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, could I ask the Minister, does he agree that the decision taken by the British Government not to release £5 million in funding because of lack of detail in the Executive's plan to address paramilitarism is deeply embarrassing for this Executive? Well, I met with the Secretary of State uh, recently and we discussed um, how we tackle paramilitary activity and the responsibilities that my department will have around this area. And I'm confident that uh, that money that's uh, being made available uh, to the Northern Ireland Executive will be released in due course uh, by the uh, Treasury. I call Philip Logan. Speaker, uh, can I ask the Minister to outline what progress he's made in promoting a culture of lawfulness in Northern Ireland? Thank you. Well, this is something, of course, which is very important, and the Department has been working with uh, the Strategic Investment Board in a scoping exercise which will make recommendations on how we can work together with our arm's length bodies and voluntary and community sector organisations to promote and develop uh, a culture of lawfulness within our society. And uh, the Department intends to run a series of pilot programmes early in 2017 to test collaborative interventions which specifically promote lawfulness. We are also working through uh, the Government Voluntary and Community Sectors Joint Forum to consider how this work can be factored into the existing partnership agreement between Government and the sector. Um, can I ask the Minister um, to give an update on any discussion his department are currently engaged in with the community and voluntary sector on how it can support the implementation of the recommendations arising from the Fresh Start panel report? Well, it, I touched on it in the previous question from my colleague Mr Logan in terms of that engagement. So the department is engaging uh, with the voluntary community sector uh, whenever we're looking at, for example, um, enhancing the role of women within communities to do that. There's ongoing work that's being taken forward uh, with those that represent uh, the, the, the women's network and so on. Um, and it'll be vitally important uh, that this is something that is delivered upon um, from the community level. Uh, government from on high uh, telling communities as to how they need to develop um, is something that I believe can only work uh, whenever you have uh, the community working with and uh, the voluntary community sector play a very important role in that uh, and they will have an important role in taking forward the recommendations. I call Jim Allister. Um, the panel report said is it is important that those who do business with government should be consistent positive examples to their communities. We recommend that the executive should review their protocols for engaging with representatives of paramilitary groups. Why then, on the very morning after another BBC spotlight exposure of paramilitary links to an office on the Shanko Road, did the minister think it appropriate to visit that office and be photographed with at least one uh, paramilitary figure? Mr Deputy Speaker, um, in terms of my engagement within our constituencies, I'll go to constituencies, I'll meet with organisations, and when I met with that organisation, uh, the conversation did take place about supporting the PSNI, upholding the rule of law, and uh, those who responded were categoric in saying that it is for the PSNI to effectively deal with issues of law and order. And what I would say to members whenever they, uh, w whenever they look at this report, I would say to them that the recommendations in that report say that we need to be supporting communities that are moving, from, uh, that are moving uh, into a transitional process. And I firmly believe that people, um, certainly within, I can only speak about uh, those within my constituency, who had a past, who have a prison record, and I recognise the work that they have been doing to move the community forward. And I'm prepared to work with those individuals on the basis that they support only the PSNI. And that's certainly the case in the individuals that I have been working with and I will continue to work with. Uh, but of course it is important uh, that organisations, uh, in terms of those protocols, are always looked at. But when it comes to being uh, the judge on all of these things, and the member would know, uh, given his legal expertise, if there are individuals who are breaking the law, 
It's for the PSNI to go and arrest and to charge. But what I have heard from a number of members, they have been acting as judge and jury when it comes to a number of these individuals, as opposed to allowing uh, the forces of law and order to deal effectively with them. It is for them to make uh, those judgments and to prosecute people where they break the law. I call Pat Sheehan for a question. Question number five, please. Deputy Speaker, I recently met with the GAA who presented the emerging design for the redevelopment of Casement Park prior to the launch of their Phase II community consultation. The design proposals presented by the GAA demonstrated how issues raised both in the 2014 Judicial Review and through Phase I community consultation have been incorporated into the designs. My department remains fully committed to the redevelopment of Casement Park and will continue to work with all parties to ensure the successful delivery of a new safe stadium at the Casement Park site. It is anticipated that a new planning application will be submitted in the third quarter of the 2016-17 financial year. Pat Sheehan for a supplementary. Thanks. Thank the Minister for his answer. Can the Minister give uh, a reassurance that the uh, social clauses for the redevelopment of Casement Park will be an integral part of the redevelopment of a new stadium? I'm happy to give that assurance. In, in terms of a lot of these contracts, uh, the Executive uh, very much is of the view that the social clauses uh, are very important so that that can help people uh, to get skills and that they would need to get on to future employment uh, and give people an opportunity. And so as this is developed, uh, that is something that I would uh, want to see being included. It will be. Uh, and then the positive impact that that will make for those that will obviously benefit from it. And then the, the community will obviously get a benefit from that. I call Christopher Stolford. Um, I'm sure the Minister would agree with me that the rights of residents who live in the vicinity of large stadiums should be respected. Uh, in that regard, can the Minister outline what actions his department is taking to address the concerns of residents who live in the vicinity of Windsor Park? Well, can I thank the, the member for this question, Mr Deputy Speaker? It's an issue that I, uh, he has raised with me on a number of occasions in respect of uh, where uh, these stadiums that are obviously in residential areas, Casement will be in a heavily uh, populated residential area, as is uh, Ravenhill or Kingspan, as is the National Stadium at Windsor Park. And, and therefore, it's important uh, that there is a constructive engagement with uh, the local community. Uh, and in respect uh, of the, the issue raised to do with the National Stadium, there is a, a community stadium board. Um, and that was a requirement um, from the department uh, in terms of the money that was allocated to the IFA. That board meets uh, on numerous occasions. It has representatives and key stakeholders, including the council, the police service, local residents, and provides a forum for ongoing local engagement and discussion. And I know that uh, there will be further work uh, with the department and officials that are working with uh, Mr. Stolford to determine the nature and the extent of the issues that are being faced uh, with residents, but it's in everybody's interests uh, that uh, these issues are effectively managed, uh, and obviously residents uh, are supportive of uh, the work that's taken place at uh, the National Stadium at Windsor Park. I call Jenny Palmer. Speaker, does the minister agree with safety as a paramount consideration that planning decisions must be made on material planning grounds? And will he encourage his colleague, the Minister for Infrastructure, to take his decision on casement on a completely non-political basis? Well, the member invites me to, to get involved in something that's not my responsibility. Uh, the, in terms of the, this application, it will be for uh, the GAA to submit the planning application. Uh, I've made it clear from uh, my point of view and the department's point of view uh, there is an executive commitment uh, in terms of developing the three stadia. Uh, this is the last one uh, that needs to be delivered upon, uh, um, but it is for the GAA to develop uh, that planning application. It's went through that process. Um, it's moving into the next phase, uh, and it is for them to navigate through the processes, uh, and obviously, um, if there is a role for the Department of Infrastructure, I, I don't know if it is a matter for the Department of Infrastructure or whether it's going to be Belfast City Council. Uh, that'll be something that I'm sure the Department will deal with uh, and deal with according to, to due process. 
Aram Sir Daniel McCrossan. I call Daniel McCrossan. Uh, does the Minister recognise the invaluable contribution that the GAA has played in communities such as mine? And can I ask what the Minister is doing to promote and support the enhancement of the sport going forward? Uh, I, I certainly do. Um, I met with uh, Danny Murphy recently. Um, and, and we had a broad conversation around how the GAA uh, plays uh, an important role within the community. Uh, and uh, it was a, a frank conversation. Uh, I very much value the work that the GAA does from a sporting perspective, and I acknowledge that. Uh, and we also had a discussion around uh, the Irish language and the more cultural dimension of the GAA, uh, and that was a conversation that was honest. Uh, and it was one where the GA were very clear of their view that that's fundamentally important to their organisation. And I indicated to them uh, that whenever I meet with the Irish Football Association, whenever I meet with rugby, uh, neither of those organisations uh, lobby me around cultural issues, and that makes the GAA unique. And I believe that that presents challenges. Um, but I recognise the importance of the GAA. Uh, it is something that, from a sporting perspective, I, I very much am supportive of. I call Chris Little. Hey, Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister if he supports the executive agreed sub regional football stadium, a funding programme commitment to redevelop the Oval in partnership with Glen Torn Football Club uh, on a budget of ten million, and why he has refused to meet with Naomi Long and I on this matter despite meeting numerous DUP MLAs on the issue? Well, not relevant to the question, of course it is for the Minister's discretion to, to determine the answer. I call Declan McLear for the question. question six. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, I believe that uh, the 2016 Ulster FLA, which was held in Bangor for the first time, and it ran over a period of nine days in July, uh, was successful. Um, there were thousands of people that attended, participated in the festival, and uh, the 25 events and sessions that took place were well supported. Uh, the Baigoa, I may have pronounced that incorrectly, uh, concert uh, had approximately, I understand the translation for that, by the way, is lively. Um, so interest, you know, that there, there's some knowledge. Had approximately 500 in attendance. The Sands family concert was also a major uh, triumph, uh, where there were 350 apparently that attended. And overall, the FLA incorporated a wide variety of events um, uh, that took place across different venues in the yards in North Down Borough. And the report from local businesses was that it was beneficial in terms of the local economy, the bed nights that it created. And the FLA was also recently awarded the best tourist event or activity uh, in the North Down <coughs> Business Awards 2016. And of course, uh, the Ulster FLA uh, is to return to Bangor in July next year. Just before I call the member for a supplementary, would I advise members to tone down the background noise a bit in order? that the questions can be heard and, indeed, the responses can be heard. Thank you for that. Uh, Declan McAleer, first. Uh, I'd like to thank the Minister for his answer. And I think the group the Minister is referring to is Bioga. So, this. So, uh, um, so can the Minister give us assurance that the work of the Cultus, the work of the Cultus will be given the same value as other federations who are involved with music and band, bands mm -hmm. within his department and ALBs? Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Unfortunately, my Irish isn't quite as good as Her Majesty's the Queen, so um, apologies for that. Uh, in terms of the, the cultural value that um, Poultice provides, it's one that I recognise. Um, and uh, like any organisations within the arts, when it comes to different funding streams that are available by the Arts Council, uh, then I would expect them to be treated fairly whenever applications are put forward uh, and where they meet the requirements within the criteria, uh, that that is something that they would be successful upon. But I've, I've said before in this House, um, I recognise the cultural diversity that exists within Northern Ireland and I believe it's something that enriches our heritage and something uh, that should be supported. Very briefly, Joanne Bunting, please. Still on a musical theme, given the successful reintroduction of the, of the Musical Instruments for Bands programme, does the Minister have plans to review this programme overall? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, um, Deputy Speaker. Uh, this has been a hugely successful uh, scheme that I reintroduced uh, that did previously exist. However, it has been highlighted in the process that 
Um, this is something that the criteria should be looked at, uh, and therefore uh, I'll be establishing a steering group that will conduct a review of the musical instruments for bands policy. And again, that's a fund uh, that is available uh, to all those who are eligible from whatever section of the community. And briefly again, Alan Chambers. Mr. Minister, I can confirm this was an event enjoyed by visitors and locals alike, and we look forward to its return. Will the Minister take this opportunity to acknowledge and compliment the work of volunteers and venue owners who make events like this happen? Thank you. Well, Deputy Speaker, um, these are events that um, are successful. Uh, in terms of North Down, uh, this generated uh, over 800 bed nights. Um, there were uh, thousands of people who attended, and, and therefore there is a benefit to the local community. Uh, and uh, those volunteers who support events like this and events that take place right across the province on a whole range of areas, whether it's cultural or whether it's sporting, um, generates a positive impact uh, for the local business community. And those businesses uh, that will embrace these activities uh, will then obviously see financial benefit for that. So it should be a win-win. Time is up. We now move to topical questions, and I call Philip Smith. Speaker, uh, the minister was asked in June by my colleague Joanne Dobson about his plans for the devolution of urban regeneration and community development powers to the 11 new councils. The minister said at the time that a decision would need to be made sooner rather than later. Uh, how is that decision coming along? Well, the decision on, on that issue will be taken soon. And uh, the member won't have long to wait in respect of the outcome of that. Uh, and obviously, the rationale um, for the decision that will be taken will be explained at that time. Um, but it's an area that I've been considering um, in the light of the responsibilities that my department has. Uh, and obviously, in due course, there'll be uh, an announcement made to this House. Philip Smith for a supplementary. Thank you. I thank the Minister for his update. Will the Minister, with his responsibilities for local government, uh, um, um, support and champion the devolution of powers uh, to local councils from all Stormont departments? And will he ensure that, if and when these powers are devolved, an adequate budget goes with them? Well, I think it is vitally important, in whatever powers uh, are transferred to local government, that uh, the resource will follow that. Um, it is a discussion that I had at the uh, partnership panel that I am responsible for chairing with representatives uh, from local government um, in respect of powers that they do have uh, and a conversation to be had about what future powers they may wish to have. Um, but I am very clear that wherever the service is being delivered, whether it is at Stormont or whether it is through local government uh, or through arm's length bodies, there is a need to make sure that the relationship is one that works effectively. Uh, and ultimately, uh, the taxpayer, the ratepayer, uh, often don't differentiate between local government and central government. Ultimately, what they're interested in is having the service delivered, and I'm interested in ensuring that we deliver the service and we deliver it effectively and efficiently. Question number two has been withdrawn. I therefore call Tom Buchanan. Deputy Speaker, could the Minister give us an update on the Community Hall scheme? Deputy Speaker, the Department launched the Community Hall's uh, pilot scheme on the 19th of October. Uh, the concept of the programme was to invest in community halls to improve the fabric of these valuable community assets, and the scheme is open to all community organisations uh, that own or hold a lease to operate a community hall. Uh, the maximum award available to a community hall is 25000 So far, the programme, Mr Deputy Speaker, I can inform the House, has generated a huge appetite. Uh, with the delivery team fielding numerous queries and has attended a number of information sessions that have been organised by various community groups throughout Northern Ireland, uh, such as the Community Armagh Community Development. The programme closes for applications at noon on the 23rd of uh, November. Late applications will not be accepted. To date, the Department has received 34 applications with a cumulative valuation of £644,000. Tom Buchanan for a supplementary. Uh, thank the Minister for his response. And in light of the huge interest that there is in this scheme, and no doubt more applications will probably come in for it, would the Minister give some consideration to allocating more money to it in year and in the years that lie ahead? Well, Deputy Speaker, obviously, um, with applications still open, and I would encourage people to continue to apply. 
Uh, there have been half a million pounds identified uh, within the department this year, um, and obviously uh, we're oversubscribed at this stage already. Uh, but I would encourage groups to continue to make applications because this is an area where I will look at resources available within the department uh, where we can find additional monies. Uh, it'll be found uh, because the value of this scheme is one that is widely recognised right across the community. Uh, and therefore, the applications should continue to come in. Uh, and I believe, given already the success, success of this uh, scheme and the interests that it has generated, this is something that we need to be looking at in future years in, in terms of the capital programme. I call Stephen Agnew. Mr. Deputy Speaker, could I ask the Minister to provide an update on the proposed derogation of the ONS decision to reclassify housing associations, including any discussions he's had with the Finance Minister on this? Deputy Speaker, the responsibility now rests in seeking that derogation from Treasury with the Minister for Finance, and therefore there is uh, ongoing work that's taking place, but the, the responsibility for uh, taking those discussions forward. Uh, as the member will know, when it comes to relations with the Treasury, uh, it is always the Minister for Finance who leads on that on behalf of uh, whatever department is impacted. In this case, it's mine. Uh, and so, therefore, the, the Minister for Finance is leading on this issue. Stephen, and you for a supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for his response. As he, as he said, the impact will very much be on his department. Is he reassured? Um, that we're going to get a successful outcome in this, given the potential impact this would have on our ability to give social housing? Is he confident going forward that we'll be able to uh, do the work that's required? Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, the Executive recognised that the travel of direction was going to take us to this place, uh, albeit we had to wait until the ONS had taken its decision. Uh, and the actual detailed decision of that uh, and how um, that would have an impact and how then we would respond to that. So the executive uh, agreed uh, that we would seek to have the derogation uh, and we have already uh, at that high level agreed the strategic approach that we have to this. Uh, now it's about seeking that derogation uh, and it's about then implementing the changes that will be required as a result of the ONS announcement. But because of the swift action that was taken by the executive, uh, I am confident that this is an issue that we are going to be able to deal with effectively. Could the Minister give us a prog progress update on his uh, small grants capital pilot programme? The small, in terms of the small grants capital programme, um, I'll come to the member with the specifics. If there's a specific area around the small grants capital programme that he wants to raise with me, uh, then I'll be happy to look at that. But in the, in the general sense, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'll need a little bit more detail here, unless he's lining me up for the sucker punch now in the supplementary. Thank you, Mike, for a supplementary. No, I'm not lining up for a sucker punch, I can assure you, Minister. Um, I was just looking for an update on level of interest, number of applications, for example. But uh, my supplementary was, I suppose, specifically around the area of partnerships. One of the focus of the, the grant program is partnerships. And I'm just curious as to know how will this be assessed, for example, would it be joint applications, or what means will that partnership be assessed by the, the, the groups that they want to collaborate together to apply? Yeah, Mr. Deputy Speaker, well, I've, I've had a bit more time now to collect my thoughts in terms of for the, the question related to the £300,000 uh, that is currently open for applications, uh, and that is, again, recognising the important work uh, that a lot of our community-based organisations carry out. Uh, applications can be made uh, for between £1,500 to up to £5,000. Uh, obviously, within that, there was the criteria around partnerships, so uh, those applications are open. Um, what I would say to those groups who are interested in that, I have a dedicated, uh, there is a dedicated resource that will be able to advise groups as to how they can apply and also the criteria uh, that uh, they need to be able to meet in order to receive this funding. But this was a scheme that, after engaging with a lot of our community uh, based organisations. They highlighted the need for small capital equipment, whether it's sports equipment, whether it's having even a lawnmower to cut the grass uh, around the facility that they use, that they often find very difficult to raise uh, that type of money to go into that capital equipment. Uh, and therefore, uh, we developed a scheme um, that I believe will be successful. 
Um, but those organisations where the member has any groups that are interested in this, um, there is support there that is available to guide people through that process. And I'm confident that this is going to be one that again will be oversubscribed. I called Gary Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, can the Minister outline his view on the recent uh, publication uh, of a report by the Londonderry Bands Forum in relation to marching bands? Well, I've been able to be up um, in Londonderry, and I've, uh, obviously my colleague has invited me on numerous occasions. There's one thing about um, the folk from the North West. They're always keen to get you up there, and when they get you, it's very difficult to get away. And uh, he, he has had a number of groups that I've met with now, and the Londonderry Bands Forum is one uh, that I've met now on numerous occasions, uh, and they've been able to demonstrate uh, the positive impact that they have had within that community. Uh, they have taken bold steps in the past. Uh, they have been able to break down um, perceptions and barriers that may have existed between communities. Uh, and it's an organisation that I believe is doing excellent work, and the, the report uh, has demonstrated that. Uh, so obviously, I'd be keen that we would take forward the work around this, uh, and in recognising that via the Arts Council, uh, it does provide support um, to the London Dairy Bands Forum around a range of activities, uh, and obviously uh, where the member is able to, to keep making the case, um, I'm very keen to support uh, this organisation and the work that it carries out. Okay, Gary Middleton for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Minister outlined earlier uh, a review in relation to the marching bands funding. Uh, will the Minister agree, or will the Minister consider as part of that review? Um, the need for the bands to have resource as well as capital funding made available? Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, this is an area where uh, I know is being raised, and not least by the member, uh, and I have asked my officials to engage with the forum along with a range of stakeholders that have an interest um, in this area. So this is something that will be given consideration uh, in those discussions that will be taking place. Um, sir, Ian Millen, for your cash, I call Ian Millen. Um, I would like to ask the Minister um, how he plans to meet the need of those requiring uh, special adapted new builds in the Middle Ulster area. Um, well, this is an area that we have been looking at, Mr Deputy Speaker, in, in terms of having special adaptions uh, made into homes, and that is equally applicable right across the province, not, not just in Mid Ulster. Uh, and therefore, it is an area that the Housing Executive are looking at around how uh, we address the needs that exist and the criteria when it comes to new builds, making sure uh, that there is scope there for having uh, buildings in place that have the special adaptions that are required for the individuals that need them. Ian Millen for a supplementary. Order, and, uh, thank you, and I thank the Minister for his response. I asked the question uh, and the knowledge of the dire need in the Mid Ulster area you know, of some families for those uh, particular types of, of new builds. And there is a long waiting list. You know, for housing associations haven't got plans, you know, to bring that about or whatever, you know, in the short term. So my question is, or the supplementary is, you know, is to ask you to, to deal with or take this here as a matter of urgency. You know, thank you, Deputy Speaker. I can reassure the member that uh, this is an area that I've been engaging with the housing executive on. Uh, I'm due to have uh, one of the the annual reviews that take place with the housing executive, uh, and let me assure the member that I'll put this issue on the agenda uh, for that formal meeting that I'll be having with the housing executive as to how uh, they will be addressing the issue that the member has raised today. Here, sir, Richie McPhillips. When you cast, I call Richie McPhillips. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the minister for his answer so far. The minister will be aware the social housing waiting list in my constituency of Mass South Tyrone is continuing to grow, and that demand for social housing greatly outweighs the supply. Can the Minister outline whether his department has plans for any new build of social housing in Fermanagh South Tyrone? Well, this is obviously an area that all members raise when it comes to the need for social housing, and, and uh, his own party uh, had a debate around the issue, and I was able to put on the record our desire uh, to deliver the numbers of social homes over the period uh, of this Assembly. Uh, and that's a challenging, ambitious target that we're setting ourselves. And of course, for Manus South Tyrone will be an area that we will want to deliver uh, new homes in. But the executive is very clear that we want to deliver uh, new social homes. We want to improve the environment that people have when it comes to housing. Uh, and there is a dedication on our side to do this. 
Uh, Richie McPhillips for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The area of urban strain in particular is suffering from the lack of social housing provision. Can the Minister outline any plans he has for the urban strain area and give assurances that he will instruct the housing executive to urgently undertake a review of the area? Well, I will be happy to take that issue up on the member's behalf in respect of Herbenstein. Um, it is the housing executive that ultimately need to, to look at these areas, working with housing associations to, to deliver social housing. Um, but I will be happy, in terms of the specific that the member has raised, uh, to raise that with the housing executive on his behalf, and I will correspond with the member. Uh, very briefly, Karen Lee Cullen for New Kesht. It's just quickly to ask the Minister to review recent correspondence he sent to me in relation to an urban regeneration scheme. His colleagues in the Housing Executive are perhaps given a different impression of the status of that scheme to local residents, and it would be helpful if you could provide some clarification on that. Okay, Deputy Speaker, well, I'd be happy to, to follow up with the member in respect to the specifics around the, the urban regeneration scheme. Um, obviously, I'm keen that we support communities, um, particularly when it comes to the urban regeneration responsibilities that this department has, um, because the value that it makes upon a community is one that I recognise, and it's something that I believe this executive can be doing more on, and I hope to, to touch on this issue in the future. Okay, time is up for topical questions. Point of order. Speaker? Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, in the course of question time, the Minister, I think, um, inadvertently misled the Chamber with respect to our position um, on 50-50 recruitment for policing. It is not the case that Alliance supported 50-50 recruitment at any time for policing, and indeed it was our Minister uh, who withdrew that provision. Um, I would like you, Mr Speaker, to review uh, Hansard and perhaps give the Minister the opportunity to set the record straight. If the, if, while not a point of order, it is a point of information, should the Minister wish to uh, adversely challenge that, or otherwise that's up to him? That point of order, I understand the Alliance Party can be very precious around these finer details at times, but my understanding is the Alliance Party did support the Patent Report. Just Point of order, Mr. Is this Speaker. A point of order? Sorry. Whoa. Further, further to that point of order, Mr. Speaker, there is a serious matter here with respect to the fact that these are not matters of political opinion, but matters of fact. Um, and the party did not support 50-50 recruitment. And for the minister to continue to insist that that is the case is now a deliberate attempt to mislead people in this chamber. Um, while. While not a point of order, it is a point of accuracy, and you have now twice had the opportunity to put your point of accuracy clearly on the record. Uh, point of order. Point of order. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This is a, a different uh, point of order in relation to Standing Order uh, 20. Uh, point eight. And uh, while obviously respecting uh, the, 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 the uh, option of the, the Speaker to act in, with his discretion in such matters, could I seek clarity for the House in, in relation to the relevance of uh, supplementary questions? Given that, in terms of question five uh, today, which to the Minister for Communities, which, re which referred specifically to Ulster GAA and, the, and Casement Park, a supplementary question was permitted in relation to Windsor Park for Mr. Stalford, but what was not permitted for my colleague, uh, Mr. Little, in in relation uh, to, uh, to, to the Oval. Uh, and further, uh, under number six, we had a question in relation specifically to the Ulster Fla in Bangor, where supplementary was taken in relation to marching bands. Could I ask the Deputy Speaker just to reflect upon uh, the consistency in terms of the approach that was adopted today, and maybe to come back to the House to provide further guidance to all yeah. members so we can better frame our questions uh, in light of the, the guidance from the Chair? The, those matters um, will be reflected upon as to their relevance as points of order and the member will receive a response from the Speaker. Mr. Speaker, is it, is it in order that a member can rise on a point of information? Uh, it was not on a point of information, just for clarification. It was described as a point of order, which I have to listen to to determine if, in fact, it is a point of order. That was how, that was how the member described it. OK, members, on that point, um, we have no further issues. Can we, the members, take their ease, please, while the chair changes?